algebra review and basically this linear algebra review as well as MATLAB fundamentals are our basic tools of how are we going to communicate in this class and then with, and after that we will uh, go in with computation tools or programming tools and really our actual topics or actual numerical <coughs> methods that we will work on are from this lecture 5 and onwards. All right, so our motivation is that just about any data you might encounter, as well as any kind of models, are stored in some sort of arrays. And if it's a 1D array of data, it could be vectors. It's called vectors. If it's 2D array, we call them matrices. But you can have basically data of any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of dimensionality. Of course, for us, it's extremely difficult to visualize data that is four dimensions and up, but computers have no trouble visualizing them. Okay. So linear algebra really provides us with very effective tools with dealing uh, for dealing with such data, for processing them, manipulating, multiplying, you, you name it. So what are some of the data that you might encounter in petroleum engineering uh, that are actually coming as either weight vectors and matrices. So I'd like you to work in pairs or either two or three at a time and come up with some examples. So let's take a couple of minutes to do that. So discuss among yourself data that is related to petroleum engineering that comes in either vector form or matrix or multi-dimensional array. Thank <laughs> you. 
in storing. All right. So our objectives in this linear algebra review are to basically review how do we add, subtract, multiply these vectors and matrices, and also certain, uh, certain other uh, manipulation of those. So we will transpose a matrix or vector. We will also recognize linear combination of vectors and calculate their inner product. And we will also figure out uh, how to calculate uh, that two vectors are orthogonal. And we will use something called vector norms, and also later matrix norms, to compare vectors and matrices. So the fact that we store things in these large arrays of numbers is great. 
except that when I actually want to compare two things, it's extremely difficult to compare two arrays. I want to do whatever comparison. I need to come up with a measure that is one number. And that's what actually vector norm is going to do for us. Okay? And if you are interested in reading the textbook on the chapter, matrix algebra overview is actually we're jumping over to uh, chapter 8 to do it. And uh, you can read it there, or you can just refer to the notes here that we have. So vector is an ordered set of real or complex numbers. That is, or we will recognize two types. I can have a column of, or a row of numbers. Okay? Now, fundamentally, in terms of actual elements, there might not be a difference between the two. Okay. Formally, there might be a difference when I start multiplying matrices and vectors. Then there will be a difference whether my vector is a row or a column. But in terms of just actual elements, either way I store it, it might be okay. Right? So there's a formal difference between a row and a vector in terms of an element that might be actually the same. And we will actually keep vectors, we will de denote them with lowercase Roman letters. And for some reason, I'm calling, whoops, okay, what happened here? Interesting. So somehow I jumped to a different file. I don't know how. Okay, I'm going to close. Okay, and all I really wanted to do is I recognized that I capitalized Roman, uh, Greek, but not Roman. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to use lowercase uh, alphabet, which is we refer to as Latin or Roman letters, uh, to denote the vector. For matrices, we will re reserve uppercase, and then for scalars, we will use alpha, beta, gamma, which are Greek lowercase letters. All right. So if I have standard vector operation, most of you probably can come up with a solution to this. So if I have two vectors, there are two, one, zero, minus one, one, and five, how do I add them up? My fourth green shirt. <laughs> so, how would you add up? Do you do it row by row? Right. Two minus one, and then one plus one. Right. So I would do two plus minus one, which is one, then one plus one, which is two, and zero plus five. So basically, my result is in the same form. It's also a column vector, and it's going to be. Uh, it's going. I'm just going to do corresponding elements, right? So addition and subtraction is relatively simple. I just take the corresponding elements and I get a result that is in the same form. Okay? Now if I was to multiply by a scalar, okay? so let's say that this first vector, 2, 1, 0, I want to multiply by a scalar. How would I do that? I'm actually telling you, this line is telling you way to do it. So let's say I want to multiply by 2. Yes, because if I do it just 1, that wouldn't be right. Doesn't sound right. So because which one do I pick then? First one, last one, middle one, right? So I'm actually going to take that scalar and multiply every element. So 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 1 is 2, and 2, two times 0 is a 0, okay? I could also do vector transpose. So that will just basically translate my column vector formally to a row vector. Okay. So if I had 2, 1, 0, I'm going to keep the same elements. I'm just going to make a row vector out of it. So what was a column will become a row, and what was a row will become a column if I transpose that vector. So these are the three basic vector operations that we're going to have.
So that basically, if I now take all of the, uh, the basic multiplication with the scalar, and if I have addition or subtraction, I'm going to formalize that. So in general, I'm going to call it linear combination of two vectors. So I'm going to take two scalars, in this case alpha and beta, and I'm going to multiply one vector with alpha and the other vector with beta. Okay. So my linear combination of these two vectors okay, is going to become, so basically alpha times first element plus beta times first element in the first place. Okay. And then alpha times second element plus beta times second element of the second vector. As a result here, this should be betas. So this is something, transcription, that didn't go well. And so forth. So I'm just going to continue all the way. So basically, I linearly combine corresponding elements. And when, so when I create W in this way, then I say that W is a linear combination of U and V. And it's also linearly dependent on U and V. So if I can get a vector out of some other vectors as a linear combination, then that vector that I get is linearly dependent on them. Otherwise, vectors are linearly independent. Okay. Now, I actually know some much more about it than it sounds. It sounds probably a little abstract. When you have a plane, you're typically describing vectors as, let's say, that I have a vector 2, 1, right? As I'm going two lengths in x direction, okay, plus one length in y direction, okay, and that's how I get the ultimate point that I'm going to, right? So that actually means that you're a linear co combination of two times your identity vector in x direction, plus one times identity ve vector in y direction. So when I'm actually describing vectors in a, co in a basis, in a coordinate system, okay, they're actually linear combination of my basis vectors in that coordinate system. That's how I'm actually describing it. So how many, at most, how many vectors can I have that are linearly independent in two dimensions? In three dimensions? Three. So the number of those basis vectors is the maximum of the number of the vectors that could be linearly independent. The moment you're introducing fourth, it has to be a combination of those basis vectors. And every vector in three dimensions I can describe as a linear combination of my basis vectors. So you kind of already know about this, you just maybe didn't give it such a name. So here are some examples. Could you, could everybody kind of work through by these, uh, these problems by themselves? Yeah, I don't have enough elements. 
formally we're going to call that dimensions don't match. So you will see later MATLAB will yell at you when you attempt to do that and it will say something about mismatching dimensions. That is the reason. Uh, who's my blue, uh, blue, blue? So what, what about here? So formally, dimensions don't match here either. But because I do have the same number of elements, my, my brain or people can do it. If you tell computer to do this, it will not do it. Okay? So computer knows a little more about dimensions or stores them. We, know, we see the same number of elements, so we'd like to do this operation. Okay? But technically, you need to transpose this vector to make it a column vector, and then you can make this operation. Or you can transpose the first vector to get a, 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 a row vector, and then you can add two vectors. Okay. So that's something that it's going to occasion, occasionally cause confusion. So again, formally, this is a column vector. This is a row vector. And formally, I shouldn't do it. But technically, I have enough elements to do it. Okay. All right. So final thing is the vector inner product. So now uh, I will actually do something with two vectors that will produce just one scalar. Okay. I will take two vectors and they will essentially get collapsed into a scalar number. And you could either look at this, well, so formally again, you will be able to do it. You will be able to do it as long as you have the same number of elements. But formally, if I'm thinking informally, we will think about a uh, matrix, and this will make a little more sense when we do matrix multiplication. Formally, we will be able to do it if I have a row vector times a column vector. But what I will get, actually, is x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus x3 times y3, plus x4 times y4. So if I had more elements, I would just keep doing it, OK? Is everybody familiar with this notation? So this is a sum. This is uppercase Greek letter sigma. This is a lowercase Greek letter sigma, just an FYI. So uh, this says that I'm summing over, as my i goes from 1 to n, x i y i. So at each step, I'm multiplying x i times y i, and my i keeps changing. And as I keep going, I'm going to add things up. So this is formally basically this operation. So I start with 1, x1, y1, plus x2, y2 plus x3, y3, and I keep going until I have elements, which is here denoted as n in general. And in this particular case, I have four of them. Yes? It says if you lose transpose the two column vectors, would you end up if you transpose the two rows? Yes. So one of them has to be transposed so that you have a row times column. It could be a trick question, essentially. Though if you just look at this formula, this formula works the moment you have the same number of elements. But this formula, this means that I have to have a row times a column. All right. So I will then use inner product to actually compare vector sizes. So I want something that is similar to absolute value. And I'm going to tell you in a moment how to get it. So essentially, my absolute value for two numbers, when I have 2, minus 2, 3, minus 40, and so forth, if I'm just interested in the size of the number, I take the absolute value, and then I can compare things. So often when I'm thinking in terms of speed, okay, and I'm thinking about cars speeding on I-35, and let's say that there is a collision. I technically care what the speed was. 
was it 60, 65, 70, 75? Not necessarily in which direction it was. Okay? So it could be north or south, I-35, here you are, in North and anywhere. So that's an absolute value. However, velocity of a car is a vector that also has a direction. So I'm going in a certain direction, and my speed is of certain value. So speed is an absolute measure of velocity. It's essentially, in terms of vector, what we refer to as length of that vector. Okay? So norms will actually, they're going to enable us to take a vector and assign this absolute value to it that will enable us to compare two vectors. Okay? So what would I like norm to be? I would like that norm, vector norm, I could have different types of norms, but I would like it to obey certain rules. One is if I have a zero vector, just a zero, I'm not moving anywhere, I'm not doing anything, norm should be zero. Okay? I should be the smallest possible norm, since norms are obviously going to be positive numbers. Okay? Also, if I have a unit vector, what I refer to as a unit vector, I would like to have things compared to that vector, so I would like it to have a magnitude of one. Okay? And again, I will then have to come up with rules how to come up uh, with the norm. And we will have different types of norms. So one example that we are com comfortable with is in Euclidean geometry. So if I had my vector, which is 3, 4, that means, as I pointed out already, you go, I'm referring to this identity vector in x direction as i. So I'm going to have 3i plus 4j, right? So this is by j is my identity vector in y direction. Okay? So the, let's say that this is my velocity. Then the speed or the length of this vector is essentially Pythagoras' theorem, right? It's the square root of 3 square plus 4 square. Everybody comfortable with this from geometry? So the speed is 5 in this case. So this geometric length or magnitude is also called Euclidean or L2 norm. But it's not the only possible norm. Okay? This is just one of them. Now, so why isn't it? So let's actually think about it. I'm going to introduce it here, and I'm going to talk about it later. I might be interested, so this is basically my airplane distance between two points. And in case I have an airplane, it's the correct distance between those two points. However, if I don't have an airplane, I'm actually going around buildings in a city. Then the length that I need to traverse between those two points will be different length. So po possibly, I am forced to travel this way, then this way to avoid some large buildings sitting here. Okay? And if so, then my length is 3 plus 4. Okay? So I will actually have, in different situations, I will have different norms, and that's why we will introduce multiple norms. So that one will be actually called L1. I'm going to introduce it in a moment. So basically, there is a whole number of possible norms, and this L2 or Euclidean norm is the one that, that we're most comfortable with. If I have n elements of a vector, I'm going to simply square all of them, add them up, and take the square root. So we will refer to this as L2 norm, and I will place a level 2 here. You could also basically express this same norm as if I multiply, the, so if I had a column vector x, then its transpose is a row. So this is that row times column that I introduced as a scalar product. Okay? So it's sort of a scalar product of a vector with itself and a square root of it. So if I go back here in this definition, if this was an x as well, I would have x1 times x1, so this would be x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square plus x4 square. Okay? So it's a scalar product of x with itself. Okay. 
It's just that I had to transpose x to make it work. So I can write this thing as a square root of a scalar product. So this is just scalar or inner product. So this is just another way to write the same thing. This is basically what you need to remember to make the formula work. Okay. So this is my L2 norm generalized to any kind of array. So even now, if I give you something from the field, like say porosities or so forth, you could actually do the L2 norm of a neutron porosity vector that comes from a velo. Okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be our two-dimensional or three-dimensional space that we are so used to in geometry. All right. Now you can define a norm, similar norms, for any number, any norm. So if I, that letter P up there is two, then I get the L2 norm. But it could be one. And if it's one, then I don't have a square root. I don't have a root. And I can just sum up the absolute values. Okay. So my norm one is just absolute values of the vector summed up. And that's precisely what I refer to here. Like absolute value of this part is three. I got to travel three blocks this way. And then I have to travel four blocks up. So I sum up three plus four and I will get the seven as a norm one of that vector that I showed. It could be any other number. We will actually not use this for any other number than one or two. Mathematicians do, in theory, and it's useful. But in theory, we will just stick to one and two. And so-called infinity, which you need a mathematical proof that once you actually take this p to infinity that you will actually get the norm infinity of a vector is simply maximum of all of these numbers. Again, I will not bother you with the proof. We'll just take it on the face value. So I will want you to remember three types of norms. Norm 2, norm 1, and norm infinity, or so-called max norm. So if I put P as 2, then it's L2. If I put P as 1, then it's L1. If I put P as infinity, and for that I will have to have a limit as P goes to infinity of this. Remember limits serious in math? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. So again, we're not going to go through formal proof of it. Let's just trust me. And again, in reality, yes. So the double is the double bar means norm. That means norm. norm means absolute value. Yes. Absolute value, that's right. yeah. Okay. So this is basically, these are scalars, okay? And this is a vector. So for vector, I need to have double bar. Yes. I don't understand the difference between L2 and L1 norm. Why is it a special case of L2 norm? Because it's just one over one. Yes, so there is no square root. So it's going to be a different number, right? Right, but I mean, it's the same thing. It's just those p's would be to the first. Special case of a p norm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. But L1 and L2 norms are two different norms. Both are special yeah. case of a p norm. OK? OK. You got it. So for <laughs> x is 1, 2, what's going to be my L1 norm? Vector 1, 2. What is L1 norm of it? It's absolute of 1 plus absolute of 2. Right? So my x1 is 1 and my x2 is 2. Okay? And that's 3. What's my L2 norm of this vector 1, 2? So it's square root of 1 plus 2 squared, which is 4. So it's square root of 5. So it's two different numbers. And then what is going to be the max norm? Yeah. So in different situations, I might be compelled to use different norms. 
If we are taking an airplane, okay, then L2 norm, if I have an airplane, I simply go from one place to another in a straight line. Not, I don't think that airplanes ever take just a straight line, but let's yeah. amuse ourselves with the thought. <laughs> go around the airports and whatnot. Yes? It's the maximum between the numbers, okay? So my absolute, in this particular case, my absolute value of 1 is 1, and max, absolute number value of 2 is 2, right? So maximum between those two numbers is, right? So it's maximum between 1 and 2, so it's the largest out of the absolute value. Now, let's see why is that useful. So... For instance, you need, in general, norms from some sort of decision making. So we are in Austin, and typically there are some watering restrictions in summer. Okay? And water is, watering restrictions are something that is agreed upon. So civil engineers and environmental engineers, they agreed upon that if combined storage level between Lakes Travis and Buchanan <coughs> drops below 900,000 acre feet, feet, so this is volume measure, okay? Acreage times feet of depth. So if that drops below 900,000, then I have stage two watering restriction, okay? And depending on the, and basically if you have stage two, two watering restriction, then you get only one day when you're Watering. So we are at 200 feet in Keaton. If we were a residential address, we would be allowed to water only on Thursday. Okay? So those are certain like we, and these are relatively arbitrary. They're from experience, from engineering ex experience. It's like, okay, below this level, city of Austin will have hard times coming up with a supply of water for everybody that might want to water their lawn golf courses or whatever it is, right? So we need to come up with restriction so that we do have our base met. In which case, water, water for drinking or regular household use is a must, but water for the lawn is not. Okay? So that gets cut based on a decision. So engineers needed this measure and this norm. This is going to be Combined storage level, if I think of it as entry one in some vector and entry two is in some vector, so volumes of these two, then the combined level will be L1 norm of my lakes vector, so to speak, lake volume vector. Okay? So somebody has, and there are there are ways to monitor, you can actually go to LCRA, uh, Lower Colorado River Authority. And you can actually online monitor levels of all lakes around Austin. So basically they have them, the measurements are coming in every day, and there is a vector that stores all of them that takes these two, sums them up, which is L2 norm of this small vector, okay? L1 norm of this small vector. And if that drops below this threshold that is imposed, then I trigger a warning. So for this type of decision making, I need a norm. I need to be able to compare. Okay? Now, again, just to emphasize once again, why would the cell one norm? I just had one example. But in terms of distance, it could be actually useful in terms of distance. So if I'm thinking myself, this is so-called a Manhattan taxi driver problem, okay? If I'm a taxi driver in Manhattan, I'm on a regular grid. And if I have to travel between point A and point B, I have, I'm snapped on that grill, grid, so I actually have to travel along this blue line. Or maybe a red line, okay? In both cases, so when I see I have one, two, three, four, five, six horizontal parts, okay? And then one, two, three, four, five, six vertical parts, okay? So that's the same length as this length of this red line. 
And if this is my vector, 6 minus 6, it's L1 norm is 12, right? And that's the distance I need to compute how far I'm going and how much gas I need. Not this distance. The green distance, which is our L2, our regular airplane distance, is approximately 8.5, so I'm way off, actually. Or long distances, I'll come up short with gas. Okay? So I do need multiple norms. But again, in different situations, we might need a different norm. All right. So again, different norms measure different things. And this is a lot of text that just comments that basically when I have L1 norm, I will have certain elements. Let's say that I have a vector that is 0.1, 2, and 30. So when I sum them up, relatively speaking, 0.1 comes in and delivers a contribution to my norm, and so does 30. Okay. If I actually have L2 norm, and I square the elements before I actually make contribution, that 0.1 would get much smaller compared to th 30 squared. So 0.1 squared is much smaller compared to 30 squared compared to 0.1 and 30, are my original numbers. So essentially, if I'm using L2 norm in the situations, in these situations, the small stuff get, will get even smaller. Okay? Whereas if I'm using L1 norm, small stuff will have rel relatively large contribution. So sometimes when I'm not sure which norm to use, I can remember then the squaring, or if I had, if my p was 3, then I would actually have cube of a number which would make it even smaller, and so forth. So basically, in terms of decision making, maybe that's important. I have to look at my data and make that decision myself. So that's just something to think about. And maximum norm, or the infinity norm, is useful when you want to just look at the worst case scenario. So you just look at the maximum number and you ignore everybody else. Okay? So you just completely emphasize just that maximum, which could be an outlier. Okay? So if you have data that wasn't measured correctly and somehow that number is just actually your measuring instrument went berserk after a power outage, I don't know, then you might not want to use max norm because you will be picking up actually a mistake. So those are things that you as engineers will be actually tasked with. You will make such decisions, and sometimes they look somewhat arbitrary, okay? and they might apply really well, or they might work really well for a year, and then there is some case that throws off your decision in your <laughs> whatever year, or down the, uh, down the line, so you have to revisit what it is that you actually came up with as a rule. Okay, so this is just a little bit of fun about norms. How many circles do you see in this picture? It's a trick question. It depends on your classes. And there are hints of the result. This is the one. I have a toddler, right? Every time I'm teaching him now that there are these little books about shapes, and this is called a circle. This is called a diamond or whatever. Okay. Well, this is a circle in our regular Euclidean geometry, where L2 norm is the base for measuring distances. Okay. So each point here is L2 distance 1 from this center. This is a circle in norm 1, or, yeah, norm 1. So let's look at this point here. This point is 1, 0, correct? Vector 1, 0. Norm 1 of it is 1 plus 0. Okay. This point here is half, half, 1, half, 1, half. Norm 1 of 1, half, 1, half is? Any point on this line, this is a line 1 minus for x, a given x, this is 1 minus x. 
So some of the two points, two x and y coordinates on this line is always one. It's, that's the definition of this line, right? So basically any point here has L1 norm 1. So technically in L1 world, or the world seen through L1 norm, this is part of a circle of radius 1, okay? Now here I actually have negative numbers, okay? So again, this is minus half, half. L1 norm of it is because I took absolute values, okay? Same thing here, same thing here. So this is a circle in L1 norm. So L1 glasses could be fun glasses, okay? Same thing here, okay? If I look at the infinity norm, the maximum between the absolute values of the entries of every vector on this line is 1, okay? Because this is line where x is equal to 1, and all of my, my x, x, x1 is equal to 1, and x2, or y, I call it often y, is between minus 1 and 1. So x2 is not larger in absolute value, okay? So my max norm here is 1, okay? Max norm here, by the same reasoning, is 1. Max norm here, by the same reasoning, is 1. And here, 1. So in this case, even though I to tell my toddler that this is a square, it's a square in Euclidean geometry. I do not confuse toddlers with that information. I do confuse sophomores with that information, okay? <laughs> so this is just a fun view. So again, depending on your norm, you see it Okay. Okay. <laughs> 